Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really delighted to present Carolina Casado. Carolina is a London-born Colombian multidisciplinary artist known for performance, video, artist books, sculptures, and installations that examine environmental issues and social issues. She's held residencies at the DAAD in Berlin, the Huntington in San Marino, and has received funding from Creative Capital, Prince Klaus Fund, and the Prince Klaus Fund. Recent solo exhibitions have been held at MoMA, New York, Ballroom Marfa, Texas, the Baltic Center for Contemporary Art, Gateshead, UK, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. I can't tell you how delighted I am to have Carolina here tonight, and I'm really looking forward to this talk. Thank you all for coming. Agua pesada Entre sinabrio y persona Ismi zawak Mutawajirun anabayna Sini barwa al insan Soy mercurio Mi temperamento volátil y errático Silatu al wasli bi merkaz al ard Concentro el universo مركز الكون أرقص للكون بايلو على الوينيفرسو من مركز الأرض أشعة دستيو كمو إسترية فولغور لوس دسلومبرا تألق نور انبهار مينيرو منساهيرو ورسولي عامل المنجم من مركز الأرض يحادث النجم متال إكستريدو مينا إكستريدا كنو ديسكريمينا pero contamina. En el ma'dan el ladhi testakhrijuhu, el manjaman ladhi testakhrijuhu, wal istakhraju el ladhi la yumayiz, lakinahu yulawith. Yo mercurio, tú tercurias, el ser curia, nos curiamos, me convierto en oro y oro enfermo. Ismi dhaban, umsi dhaban saqiman. En aludel me quemo y evaporo con metales. في الوثل أتبخر وأحترق بالمعادن. إيهوز دل الفريرية. أبناء الفخار. دي الفريرو سرغيوسوس. فخورين. الكيميا لتال. الذهب السقيم من المعادن هو نقود المعادن. بريميرو متال. بداية أنا معدن. سيغوندو دينيرو. ثانيا أنا نقود. ترسيرو المسن. ثالثا مخزن. كوارتو كابيتال. ورأس مال رابع. Rabia, ras, mal, amalgama de capitales. Malgam un firas el mal. Mercurio, zawak, mercado, suq. Mercurio y mercado, zawak o suq, el zawak, yani suq. Mercado de mercurio, suq o zawak. Azogue, azogarse, ahogarse, fui mercurio. Con tu zawakan. Ahora, mercado y mercancía. Y en el an, suq y sal'a, zibaq. Puerto sin puerta. Mina un bila bab. Mina. Bab. Mina un mayit. Puerto muerto. Mina un mayit. Mata el mina. Se murió la mina. Mata el manjam. La mina que mata. Mina mata. Agua, muerte. El ma, el maut. الزئبق باية انتوكسيكادا الخليج المخمور بيسز فنينوسوس الأسماك السامة كوربوس تمبلوروسوس الأجساد المرتعشة نيرفيوس ترستورنادوس الأعصاب المضطربة مي بيو أكمولو إن تيرا أغوى إي أيري أنا أجمع وأعيش نفسي أنا أجمع عيش نفسي أجمع عيش على الأرض والماء والهواء الفتورة دماندة أنا أردن Consignar el mercurio al pasado. Y te talabu el mustaqbalu tartiban. El zibaku fil maadi. Mina mata. Mina mata. Primer acuerdo ambiental de alcance mundial. Awal utifaqiyyat un biiyyat un alamiyya. Mineros artesanales sin mensaje. Omalu el manajum bila nujum. Rasael bidu ni rasael. Alfareros sin orgullo. Omalu el fukhar bila fakhr. Destellos apagados. En anwaru mukhmada. Tiempo de nuevas amalgamas. Zamanu ni mulgamat en jadida. Umbrales de resistencia. Atabat el mukawama. Alquimias para la vida. Alquimia el hayat kuliha.
Thank you, Emira Hasnawi, who has read Heavy Water, Agua Pesada with me. Um, Emira Hasnawi is a PhD candidate in the Department of World Arts and Cultures and Dance here at UCLA. Her work aims to demystify trans healing music rituals practiced by black Tunisians. She incorporates film and photography in her research and she aspires to create a hybrid project that features a museum exhibition of the material culture of these idioms. She received an MA in popular culture from Bowling Green State University in 2017, where she was the president of the Graduate Student Senate and the Graduate Women's Caucus. Gracias, Emira. Shukran. Um, and I'm running out of battery in my computer, so I need to connect this and maybe um, Maybe the tech folks can help me connect this battery thing. Because I'm not sure where. Yeah, sorry. My bad. We didn't connect it. <coughs> and thank you, um, Chandler, for the introduction, too. <coughs> so, um, this is the Almaden mine uh, in Spain, in Castilla La Mancha. The Almaden mine um, is the largest deposit of mercury in the world. Um, it has approximately produced 250,000 metric tons of mercury in the past 2,000 years. The name of Almaden is from the Arabic word, word Almadin, meaning the metal or the mineral, and so by extension, the place where these are excavated, the mine. Almaden is home to the world's greatest reservoirs of cinnabar, a mineral associated with recent volcanic activity from which mercury is extracted. From antiquity, cinnabar was used to make the pigment vermillon, which is red, and this is the likely end use of the mineral extraction of Almaden during the Roman periods. But during the Islamic era, furnaces, which is what you see here, which are bottomless pots associated to alchemical technology and capable of extracting mercury from the cinnabar were installed because they would roast the cinnabar in these furnaces. With the more advanced expertise available to the alchemist of Al-Andalus, the mines of Almaden exported mercury throughout the entire Mediterranean basin. Now, the Hornos de Bustamante, or the Bustamante furnaces, which you see here, started construction in 60, 1647, when mercury became very valuable in the Americas due to the introduction of amalgamation, a process that uses mercury to extract metals from gold and silver ore, and it's super toxic and pollutant. The demand for mercury grew, and so did the town's importance as a center of mining and industry. Most of the mercury produced at this time was sent to Sevilla, then to the Americas. So actually the first mineral to be transported between Europe and the Americas was from Europe to the Americas, and it was mercury. Due to the toxicity of mercury and its byproducts, the mine has variously employed penal labor, slave labor, and prisoners of war over its long history. Workers in Almaden mine would be called forzados, a term that then gave way to the Spanish term trabajo forzado, or in English, forced labor. Almaden mines stopped working in 2002 due to the prohibition of mercury mining in Europe. Here is like an old design of the furnaces of Bustamante. So 160 clay pots painted with poetry with actually the poem Agua Pesada that you heard at the beginning of the presentation um, uh, were presented as part of the installation of the same name, Agua Pesada, early last year in Sharjah. Um, the pots that replicate the furnaces of Bustamante at the same size are painted with poetry inspired by the etymological, economic, and cultural con connections between the Spanish and Arabic word for mercury, asoge, asoch, I think I'm pronouncing it well, um, 
The tidal reference is one of the many synonyms for mercury used by medieval Arabic alchemists, heavy water. The clay pots are modeled after the Hornos de Bustamante of the Almaden mines in Spain, a monumental aludel furnaces used to roast cinnabar ore and process quicksilver. The aludel is a bottomless pot used in alchemy for sublimation, also referred to as the hermetic vase, the philosopher's egg, and the vase of philosophy. Mercury is particularly rich in synonyms, and the alchemical dictionary lists almost 50 possible names, including life of the bodies, the horizon, the water of the moon, the support of the bodies, the soul, the lightning, the water of the snake, and heavy water. The Arabic language keeps alive the understanding of minerals in tune with the pluriverse's palpitations. In Arab, the words for minor and astrologist differ only by an accent. The person dedicated to mining is the one who can see glimmers in the earth, the one who recognizes the light of the stars in the sinkhole. Asoge, souk, market, mercury. In the poem, we explore these etymological and phonetical resemblances between the Arab and the Spanish languages. And we understood that asoge and souk, market and mercury, have an etymological similar root. The poem also goes on, and it's written in first person, to tell the history of mercury through its extraction at Almaden and all the way to the Minamata conventions. The Minamata, con uh, sorry, the Minamata uh, disease is the popular name for hidrargia, which is the mercury disease. Minamata also sounds very similar to dead port, precisely, in Arab. So Minamata disease is a neuro neurological disease caused by severe mercury poisoning. Uh, the symptoms include ataxia, numbness, numbness in the hands and feet, general muscle weakness, loss of peripheral vision, and damage to hearing and speech. Workers in al Madin would only last a couple of years. They would die after being forced labor there. In extreme cases, insanity, paralysis, coma, and death follows within weeks of the onset of the symptoms. And a congenital form of the disease affects fetuses in the womb, causing microcephaly, extensive cerebral damage, and symptoms similar to those in cerebral palsy. Minamata disease was first discovered in the city of Minamata in the Kumamoto prefecture in Japan in 1956, hence its name. And it was caused by the release of metal mercury in the industrial wastewater from a chemical factory owned by Chiso Corporation, which continued from 1932 to 1968. A long battle happened, legal battle, and it took 12 years to Chiso to start paying um, indemnizations to those affected by the Minamata disease. So, Mercury bioaccumulates and biomagnifies in the shellfish and fish of the Minamata Bay, which then was eaten by the local population, resulting in the mercury poisoning. This poisoning continued in animals and humans for 36 years. And the International Convention to Stop the Production and Distribution of Mercury is actually called Minamata. And it's the most recent global agreement on environment and health adopted in 2013. Again, it's named after the Bay in Japan, and it entered into force the 16th of August of 2017. Pretty recent, I think. Parties have been working together to control the mercury supply and trade, reduce the use, emission, and release of mercury, raise public awareness, and build the necessary institutional capacity to, quote-unquote, make mercury history. Not all the countries have signed the convention. China is one of them that hasn't signed it, for example. So the same year that the Minamata Convention um, was uh, sorry, entered into force in 2017, the World Bank published a report called The Growing Role of Minerals and Metals for a Low-Carbon Future, 
which concluded that to realize a low carbon future, there will be a substantial increase in demand for several critical minerals and metals to manufacture cleaner energy technologies. In other words, the clean energy transition will be a significantly, significantly mineral intensive. This report was followed by another one, this one, in 2020 called Minerals for Climate Action. The mineral intensity of the clean energy transition, which for me is already an oxymoron in that very title, which finds that the production of minerals such as graphite, lithium, and cobalt could increase by nearly 500% by 2050 to meet the growing demand for clean energy technologies. It estimates that over 3 billion tons of minerals and metals will be needed to deploy wind, solar, and geothermal power, as well as energy storage required for achieving a below two grades future. So here we see, for example, that copper is substantial in all this quote unquote clean energy technologies, wind, solar, concentrated solar power, hydro, geothermal, energy storage, nuclear coal, gas, carbon capture and storage. So still some dirty energies, clean energies, but basically the 16 minerals are those that the World Bank predicts as our mineral intensive future. So I decided to go ahead and portray these minerals, or at least start, it's an ongoing series. I've started portraying some of them. Uh, mineral Intensive is an ongoing series that portrays minerals included in this World Bank 2020 report, representing the multiple scenes of labor, environmental extraction, and the energy conver conversion processes required to meet the growing demand for energy transition. Exploitation of minerals have sown death in many ways. Millions of native people died poisoned and enslaved in the gold and silver mines of the European colonies of the Americas. This image is cobalt intensive. Oh yeah, the title is there. They continue to be most, the most vulnerable communities by um, illegal garimpo mining and by the large scale mining carried out by transnational capitals in our continent in the Americas. Digging up metals and oil brings disease and death literally to the surface, and symbolically too. Many indigenous folks across the Americas say that oil is literally death that has been buried under the ground, and when we bring it up into the surface, it brings disease and death to the surface. So this is aluminum here on this side, and on the farther side is copper. You will see that Images of labor are always included, the technologies they serve. There's always a small mapa mundi, normally black with dot, red dots that identify the largest deposit of that mineral. Uh, so the ones that are pred uh, predicted to be exploited up to 500% more uh, from here to 2050. Graphite, nickel, last year uh, a collective called Peoples of the South published a manifesto called Manifesto from the Peoples of the South for an Ecosocial Energy Transition and I'm going to quote a couple of paragraphs from this manifesto. The problems of the global geopolitical South are different from those of the global North and the rising powers such as China. An imbalance of power between these two realms not only persists because of colonial legacies, but has deepened because of the neo-colonial energy model. In the context of climate change, ever-rising energy needs and biodiversity loss, the capitalist centers have stepped up and pressure to extract natural wealth and rely on cheap labor from the countries on the periphery. Not only is the well-known extractive paradigm still in place, but the North's ecological debt to the South is rising. 
What's new about the current moment are the clean energy transitions, quote unquote, of the North, clean energy transitions of the North that have been put in more pressure on the global South to yield up cobalt and lithium for the production of high-tech batteries, balsa wood for wind turbines, land for large solar arrays, and a new infrastructure for hydrogen megaprojects. This decarbonization of the rich, which is market-based and export-oriented, depends on a new phase of environmental exploitation of the global south, which affects the lives of millions of women, men, and children, not to mention non-human life. Women, especially from agrarian societies, are amongst the most impacted. In this way, the global south has once again become a sacrifice zone, a basket of perfectly inexhaustible resources for the countries of the north. And this is, uh, it's online, it's in many languages. I really invite you to, to dig deeper into this document. So how can we establish another kind of relationship with minerals, one that is not directed by the mineral intensive future that the World Bank offers or is trying to impose on us? Perhaps looking to the past gives us clues to move forward. Historically, minerals have been used to build talismanic objects with the potential to protect, to heal, and to be knowledge transmitters. They can question established perceptions of reality, or they can remind us of past violences in order to not repeat them, such as the use of forced labor in the mining industry. Um, the amulets for energy transition that you see here are inspired by historical amulets from the Middle East. These amulets for fair energy transition are made with the very minerals needed to supply the increase in demand of transition technologies. These this two tongues, for example, are made uh, with aluminum. Aluminum, graphite, copper, lithium, and cobalt, among others, are forged to safeguard ecosystems and communities where the intensive mining of minerals is threatening local biocultural diversity. These amulets propose the possibility of, for contemporary art to reconnect with the occult and the magical as a form of knowledge and as a tool to realign humans' relationship to the earth. The amulets made with minerals extracted mainly from the global south to supply the energy transition and the decarbonization of the global north reflect directly on my work as an artist and the different potentials of art making. Uh, Nazar, this one is um, carved, the front is carved in copper and then pat patina and the back is nickel ore. These small sculptures created to be used as protective amulets, hence their size, they all fit in your hand or in your pocket, they're very small. Continue an approach in my work where objects are conceived as visual spells. The art practice itself becomes a space for unlearning given notions around contemporary art and for the construction of my own artistic genealogies. This is um, a tower carved in graphite. And uh, Burj is uh, the Arab for tower, and they're very traditional structures that you find all around the Arab world. They would be sort of like uh, vigilante towers that would protect a community. If in Arab the person dedicated to mining is the one who can see glimmers in the sinkhole, for the Yanomami cosmovision of the Amazon, the universe once collapsed over the earth originating the world and the beginning of time in an act of regeneration. This is a little uh, box. It's really small. It fits in the palm of your hand, and it's inspired by very small amulet Quran holders that you find um, along the Arab world. Uh, it's very typical to write verses of the Quran or print very tiny, tiny Qurans and put them in these little jewel boxes or even sometimes they have a more kind of a cigarette shape where you kind of roll the verse of the Quran and put it in there and hang it as a pendant. And this is a copper uh, box in, encrusted with uh, lithium quartz on the top and it holds also this lithium quartz in its interior. 
This is a copper pin uh, with a disc of cobalt engraved with a with a um, a womb symbol that's used by the Pueblo people here in the southwest. It's a it's a uh, an amulet for the forced labor children that are forced uh, into labor in mining industries across the world. This is a little hourglass that has raw gold inside, postponing the end of the world. It doesn't take any time at all, or count any time. And, and this is a copper tree, uh, kind of sculpted after a banyan tree or rolla, which are um, very traditionally planted in the center of a town to provide a fresh and kind of shaded place to gather and to meet in the middle of the town. So, as I was saying, for the Yanomami cosmovision of the Amazon, the universe once collapsed over the earth, originating the word, the world, and the beginning of time in an act of regeneration. This is explained by Davi Kopenawa in the book, The Falling Sky. I open quotes. What the white people call minerals are the fragments of the sky, the moon, the sun, and the stars, which fell down in the beginning of time. This is why our, our long ago elders have always called the shiny metal Mareashi or Shitikarishi, which are also our names for what the white people call st the stars. So the pagamento or payback is a way of giving back part of the stars that constitute the earth. This ancestral practice has both an economic and ecological purpose that goes beyond the symbolic the minerals are buried as an underground altars to guarantee the planet's inhabitants that the balance between the sky and the earth remains stable. The burial, then, is transformed into life. Through pagamento or retribution to nature, because nothing in nature is for free, death and life become steps of the same path. So I'm going to share uh, a video. Um, it's called Fuel to Fire. It's a single channel video that brings the viewer into a pagamento or payback of gold into a body of water. This ritual was performed for the well-being and conservation of the Santurban moorland ecosystem within the high mountains of northwest Colombia, which holds large sought-after deposits of gold. Again, the pagamento is an indigenous ecologic and economic fundamental protocol that maintains the flow and balance of life cycles on Earth. When accumulation happens, sickness arrives, and so it's necessary to give back by letting go of something that is dear, that implies labor, or that is highly symbolic. And the pagamento we're going to see in the video is, doesn't follow any ritual in particular, is my own pagamento. Thank <laughs> you. 
Santurban Are glimmers, glimmers in the earth. From different coordinates, we carry out the work of warming our communities, ensuring food, and understanding the rhythms of the permanent dance between beings. We are beacons of hope in this extractivist world, where minerals are strategically classified as natural resources instead of common goods a term we propose with the intention of recovering their talismanic value. Can we reconsider the hegemonic ways in which we relate to ourselves, to each other, and to other beings, animate or inanimate, and transform those relationships into spaces of affection, reciprocity, and mutual care? Audrey Lorde offers us a clue in her poem, Coal. Coal. I is a total black being spoken from the earth's inside. There are many kinds of open. How a diamond comes into a knot of flame. How a sound comes into a word colored by who pays what who, for speaking. Some words are open like a diamond on glass windows singing out within the crash of passing sun. Then there are words like stapled wagers in a perforated book, buy and sign and tear apart and come whatever wills all chances. The stub remains, an ill-pulled tooth with a ragged edge. Some words live in my throat, breeding like adders, others no sun seeking like gypsies over my tongue to explode through my lips like young sparrows bursting from shell. Some words bedevil me. Love is a word, another kind of open, as a diamond comes into a knot of flame. I am black, 
because I come from the earth's inside. Take my word for jewel in your open light. And so I guess there's some time for questions and answers. Maybe we can turn on the lights for the whole room, please. Does anyone have any questions? Hi. Thank you so much for that amazing lecture. Um, my question was, um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit on the rhetoric and the mindset kind of surrounding that extractivist language like natural resources and perhaps if you could describe some like uh, alternatives that you've come across in all the like work and research that you've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's um, definitely, and, and thanks for bringing language up, like <clears throat> definitely language is a battleground, I think, no? And the f people in the front lines who are put in their bodies in the front lines are definitely um, a good place to look at in terms of how language is being updated um, kind of within justice framework or environmental justice frameworks, and that's where I look at. So from, from that experience, the term common goods is one that I use instead of natural resources. Natural resources implies that um, these elements are there for our extraction, right? Um, they're a resource. Um, I don't know, even me growing up, I'm 45, when I was growing up, I was taught in primary school that water was a renewable resource, for example, and that is already outdated. We know that water is not a renewable resource, and we know that we're in a drought, actually, or that our polluted waters, how are we going to repair that? So yeah, this term of natural resources seems a little bit um, to continue establishing humanity on top of everything else, and I think um, that's kind of one of our dooms and why we're in this kind of climate collapse. Instead, common goods seems to be a more generous space in terms that it's something that we inherit, that we have to take care of, and to leave uh, for our future generations. Um, yes, I mean, I could go on with other terms, but <laughs> I know. For example, I, I, I find very problematic the word sustainability, too. Literally, it like according to its dictionary meaning, it's the ability of maintaining the rate uh, of something, of production. That's to maintain sustainable, is to maintain the rate of. And I think hopefully we all agree in this room that if we maintain the rate of production and consumption at what we have now, we're probably going to be extinguished as humanity much faster than what we can imagine. So the word sustaining for me, uh, is, is uh, kind of kinder. I like to think of my work in that terms. How can we produce work as cultural workers that can sustain? Because to sustain something is to nurture, to give life, to maintain the life, right? And that's very different from trying to be sustainable. Any other questions? Um, thank you again for the for the talk. It was very inspiring and has me thinking a lot about the materials that I use in my own practice. Um, and certainly the last video as well, in addition to thinking about and being intentional about the language you use when you are using the materials, um, are there any particular like protocols or any particular methodologies that you use in in using them, I mean, there's such like loaded history behind so uh, a lot of painful history for a lot of people mm -hmm. in the mining extraction process and um, the environmental degradation. Is there something that when you receive these materials to then use that you feel like, I don't know, maybe like cleanse them or I don't know what, I, I'm just curious if there are any type of protocols that you use for, since you're working with these materials that have, so, they're so loaded mm -hmm. um, socially. 
Yeah, I don't cleanse them as such. I think the practice of working with them and like transforming into these amulets, at least those minerals, is already a kind of just to imagine them that they can exist, you know, outside of technology and doing something else is already a, a different kind of protocol. Um, but I do, I do take time to decide if I want to be able to work with it or not. So there's a lot of, and if the research process is kind of a cl cleansing process in a way, if you think about it. That, so kind of try to inform myself as much as I can about this material before, or about the situation, or about the history of something, before even allowing myself to work with it. Um, as much as I can, I do my best. But that's a little bit what happens, yeah. So I, I wanted, or you know, for example, that goal that I paid, I think that was a protocol that became the video, yes, but I had, um, through working with communities impacted by hydroelectric hydro dams, that is kind of a body of work that I've developed for the last 10 or 15 years, I got close to rivering communities, fisher folk, artisanal miners, and for a number of years I was buying directly to the gold harvesters and they refer to their process of washing gold as a harvest to differentiate from extraction, for example. So that's something they use in the language. And I had been buying this harvested gold from the river directly from some miners that I've known and continued to be in relationship with. And I had done already a number of videos with them um, in the past uh, and the amulets with the gold and the kind of hourglasses. And then I realized that I had a, a, been accumulated, um, accumulating cr uh, cultural capital and economic capital through these works. And so it was time to return it. So the work itself is a protocol of sorts, if you wish. That's helpful, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well thank you so much, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. And thank you, um, Amira, for the last minute call we just met today. So.